Welcome to the Unlicensed Podcast. As always, I'm Caleb. We've got Tassos over here. Hello. And th- <laughs> this week, we are excited to be hosting Richard Bernhardt from WISPA and a bunch of other things. He's a, a very busy man, so we really appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us. Um, before we hop into this real quick and do our introductions and such, Tassos, give the good people out there their call to action, and then we'll hear our catchy little team. Absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, or subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcasts like Apple, Google, or Spotify. (laughs) All right, Richard. I really appreciate you again taking the time to talk to us today. Um, For those of you who don't know Richard, he's uh, he's been at this a little bit, uh, knows a few things, so probably best to just let him kind of kick into an intro, tell a little bit about your history, uh, how we've gotten where we are. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, I'm Richard Bernhardt. I'm the senior vice president. I'm the vice president of Spectrum and Industry for WISPA. Um, I've been around WISPA a little over 15 years, and WISPA is coming up on its 20th year, so you know that there's a lot of history there. Uh, I also sit on the board of directors and on the lead management of the Wireless Innovation Forum. That forum has brought you both CBRS and 6 gigahertz baseline standards, so the reason that those things work and the reason that they are out there in the wild today is because uh, standards and regulatory work together and we protected uh, fixed wireless in the process. I'm also the chair of the uh, fixed wireless access for OnGo Alliance. Some of you may have known that as the CBRS Alliance. Uh, They changed their name to be clever, but it is the same organization. (laughs) Um, So I try and keep a a fair and even perspective on the non-mobile approaches to things in uh, in that group, although some mobile carries over into fixed wireless, um, WISPA and uh, ONGO have an alliance, and so we uh, spend a lot of time talking about topics fixed wireless. All right, all right. So as everyone can see, you've uh, you got a lot on your plate. You've you've been around, and there's a lot of hot topics. You know, especially as we roll out of WISPA America. You know, we just finished that show up a few weeks ago. Great show as always. Great venue. Um, Great venue. Yeah, fantastic yeah. venue. Yeah. I got to so, say. A beautiful place. Yeah. yeah. I was really, really impressed and loved it. I hope we can do it there again sometime. Yeah, yeah for sure. Walked outside and I'm like, wow, this is this is really slick. So, <laughs> but good show. No you know. weeds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... You know, there's a lot of these topics that are covered at the show, but it's good. Like, we like to review things for folks that weren't able to make it, different reasons and stuff like that. And honestly, you know, I think the hottest topic, obviously, right now is 6 gig, the AFC. Where are we really, really? Why is this so gosh darn confusing? Like, are we ready? Are we not? So, if you could uh, shed your light of knowledge and experience on this topic a bit and kind of give us a status update. Granted, that could change entirely by the time this yeah. thing goes out in a couple of days. But. <laughs> well, like all uh, bands, especially shared bands, everything is in flux all the time. Um, but it's not as complicated as it seems. It's actually far less complicated than CBRS. And uh, so let me let me start at the beginning, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where we came from with 6 gigahertz and where we are today. Um, 6 gigahertz is an experiment, uh, much like CBRS was an experiment, in sharing spectrum with other um, incumbent operators. In CBRS, we shared that with us. Uh, we were the incumbent 965 um, nationwide license holder for Part 90. Uh, We shared it with satellite um, ground devices, and we shared it with the all-popular United States government uh, in its uh, radar systems, its SPIN-43 and other radar systems that need to be protected, especially on the coastlines of the United States. So those were all incumbents in CBRS. In 6 gigahertz, we don't have as much of the government influence but many of the fixed wireless providers and ISPs and many of the WISPs out there uh, do hold licenses for point-to-point uh, 6 gigahertz backhaul. And uh, not just WISPs, AT&T and many other uh, large entities also use that band for its backhaul, as do critical uh, utility operators and many, many others. So in this case, instead of sharing with SPIN-43 radar systems, 
we're sharing it with critical uh, backhaul systems, nuclear plants, railroads, all that sort of stuff. And so you have to protect them and you have to protect us because we're the, also the license holders. So what was uh, derived was a thing called the AFC system. And that sounds scary because it's a system and it's attached <laughs> to your radio and it's not <laughs> something that you're used to doing because we're used to just putting up radios and making them go. So the uh, AFC system, like the SAS system, is a coordinating uh, device. It's there for the purpose of making information available so that you avoid colliding uh, with the incumbents, and we have a happy existence. Unlike CBRS, this uh, AFC systems, or automatic frequency control systems, uh, do not talk with the other ones. So SASs talk amongst each other. AFC systems do not talk amongst each other. In CBRS, there's an aggregate interference level that's looked at. All the radios are taken into account when we're figuring interference. In 6, six gigahertz, not so much. Uh, in fact, they, there is no aggregate interference. All that the AFC does is reaches out to databases that give them information about where incumbents are living and where they propagate to so you can avoid them. And that's what you're doing when you're aligned with an AFC. Your radio reaches out to make sure that at the time that you're going to be broadcasting, the power and direction uh, that you're going to use with your 6 gigahertz standard power outdoor radio will not collide or create problem or havoc with the shared user who is mostly point-to-point -point, um, systems. There are a few other users in the band that are not terribly going to get in the way of any particular uses, but they are protected as well by the AFC system. So when you buy a tested and certified device, a device that's compliant with the ecosystem, it already takes into account that AFC and that your radio will reach out to the AFC and say, hey, where can I broadcast? Now, when we first started CBRS, there's a very tight connection between the operator and the SAS. Uh, so tight that if the SAS goes off the air or does not respond in four minutes and 59 seconds, <laughs> boom, you are required to go off the air. So tight that if an EFC system uh, even makes a peep, you must at a minimum go off the air for two hours to avoid colliding wow. with the incumbents. Shift back to six gigahertz, it's 24-hour heartbeat check-in, not four minutes and 59 seconds or every minute you can check in once a day to make sure that you're not going to collide with an incumbent operator. So it's much easier and it's much more flexible. And six gigahertz sits in the band just above where Wi-Fi on the five gigahertz band looks, uh, five eight, and it, it's uh, 1250 megahertz of spectrum across the entire band. It's 850 megahertz of usable frequency in the standard power uh, frequencies. And guess what? After two and a half years of work, and that seems like nothing compared to what we did with CBRS, which took us eight years. In two and a half years of work, the band's open. The The uh, standards are complete, both on the AFC side and on the product side, on the, on the device side. Um, the Wireless Innovation Forum and the Wi-Fi Alliance collaborated a tremendous amount along with the multi-stakeholder group. And as of today, the FCC, or no, it's actually as of a few weeks ago, the FCC put out a public notice indicating that the AFC operators are no longer in a holding pattern, but rather have been certified to operate. And since then, 11 devices um, have now been tested and certified in the ecosystem. So you have a pretty broad group of things coming into line. Um, that's still pretty narrow on the amount of equipment and on the AFC sees in operation, but they are live and watch for many more to come uh, in short order. Yeah, the uh, FCC certification sort of final, the equipment cert part was always the part that kind of terrified me, right? Because it was like, all right, AFC seems pretty straightforward, but there were no certs coming out for equipment yet. I've done a lot of part 15 stuff back in the day. So right. you would think it's pretty straightforward, but this is a whole new thing. So luckily when that first one came through, I guess sometime in February or so, it was like, okay, they actually have a process and a way to sign mm -hmm. off on this, which was <laughs> extremely uh, re relieving, I guess would be the word for it, for sure. So unlike CBRS, which, you know, uh, it falls into the 3.5 to 3.55 to 3.7 band only in the United States because it's a it's an American band. 
the the six gigahertz band is uh, as close to a harmonized band as one can possibly get and i say as close to because there really are no harmonized bands and nor are there likely to be in the future because we just don't get a we don't get along with other countries and when it comes to spectrum <laughs> or there's things that get in the way of us agreeing uh wrc 23 just took place uh, in Dubai, it happens every four years. It's a big collaboration, especially of European providers, and they look at bands that are out there and which ones we should try and harmonize. Well, if you look at six gigahertz, um, a good part of the world is actually using some portion of that 1200 megahertz for this purpose. Uh, and a lot of them are going to be using AFC systems, and a lot of them are using it for unlicensed or licensed by rule uses. Um, or they're sharing them with uh, mobile or licensed uses. So you are seeing uh, a lot of countries around the world quasi-harmonize with the United States on the use and the approach. Yeah, it was funny when Canada uh, kind of came out first, and I was like, well, that was spicy. <laughs> not, not expecting that one, you know, but um, it, was, it was good to see. It may have been a little bit of kick in the shorts to somebody to – hopefully get this out of wrapped up, but just kind of talking. Yeah, we have a very good working relationship with Canada. And in fact, at Wind Forum, at the Wireless Innovation Forum, uh, we, we've been working with Canada for several years. So while we probably would have been happier if we were the first ones out the gate, but uh, Canada is using a lot of what we derived uh, to make it theirs work. And that's what I mean by harmonize, that there is discussion going on here. While it may not be legal plateau to say that Canada and the United States or any other country is following lockstep what they have to follow. Um, it, they are following a lot of the same methodologies and approaches, and that's good. Okay. Yeah. And then, and just to be clear, like if a, if a manufacturer has an AP and a CPE that are type certified by the FCC to operate in this band, they've got all the firmware stuff to talk to the AFC, like it is now completely with, legit to do commercial deployments with those. Is that the proper assumption? That there is one more roadblock that that um, so far only one of the companies that is uh, certified has surmounted, and that's geolocation. Mm -hmm. um, they there is a form of geolocation that the FCC is requiring so that they can understand where the radios are, and it's perfectly understandable why they want to know this. If we take a look back at the TV wide space um, area, there were. Uh, databases, just like there are databases being used in, uh, in, by the AFCs. There were radios that had a sort of nationwide approach to things. They had to reach out to those databases to determine which of the formerly analog TV stations were available for radio communications. And lo and behold, people weren't entirely honest about where they were with their devices. Yeah. So we had some devices <laughs> that were showing up in New York when they were really in Los Angeles and the like. Wow. So geolocation is one of those things that the FCC is paying greater attention to because if you want to protect incumbents, you have to protect incumbents on the ground in which you stand, not on the ground in which you wish you stood. And that's why, so, and that was kind of a, a thing that popped up recently. People were a little bit surprised that was requiring an active GPS puck, like in the CPE device, right? Right. You know, because everyone was used to, you know, it made sense originally with doing the, your AP device. And I'm speaking in general terms with, you know, space that we typically operate in. But the, the CPE side was relatively new. So I think, uh, but people are getting that figured out. So. Yeah, I mean, in CBRS, the CPE is actually a CBSD. That's a lot of letters to say all in one mouthful. Mm -hmm. But a CBSD is the, the radio entity that fits into uh, CBRS, and there's either category A, which are lower power or lower power indoor, and there's category B, which can be used outdoor. But the fact of the matter is that even though it's called a client, it is a CBSD, and it has the impact and ability to interfere with a, uh incumbent. So you have to consider it a radio just like you consider anything else. It may be a lower power radio. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you use a category B device as your CPE. But if you are using a CBSD as your CPE or you are using a, a type and a, and certified approved radio as a CPE in, in 6 gigahertz, they do radiate. And we are trying to uh, make sure that both uh, CPE, AP, wherever there's a radio that radiates and transmits, it uh, uh, is safe to protect the incumbent. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, interesting. Okay. So I, I have uh, <clears throat> some questions on the interference side. So you had mentioned with the AFC, um, it simply checks in, you know, once a day and says, hey, you know, am I safe to operate on this frequency in, in this area, let's say, right? The AFC says, yes, it's fine. Okay. Let's say you start creating noise. What's What's the kind of mechanism or how does anything, if anything can, shut down your system because it's been deemed as an interfere. How does that work? Yeah. So unlike a SAS who has the power to actually tell you right. to shut down. We were going to um, get there. <laughs> in the, in the, in the six gigahertz world, um, it's more of if you're causing interference and you know it, then you're an intentional and fair interferer and you need to get out of that band. You, it, it, mm-hmm. This is not a black and white area. I mean, it's not a gray area, it's black and white. Um, However, the mechanism for reporting interference by by someone who is being interfered with is still a bit of a mystery. And the AFC systems have till uh, middle or end of April, which is coming up very fast, to come up with a, and this will sound strange, collaborative method of uh, reporting uh, interactive uh, or, or interference uh, problems so that they can be resolved. The FCC has not gone into detail about how they'll resolve interference claims or or recordations, uh, whether they will use their enforcement bureau or whether they'll leave it to industry to do something about it or whether they'll let the AFCs do something about it. Um, At the moment, there is no mechanism of an AFC shutting down a 6 gigahertz radio because they don't have the methodology or knowledge of doing that. They also don't know what radio frequency you are actually broadcasting on. That's not recorded. So they're giving you information on where you can broadcast and at what power, or perhaps the AFC t- looks at it as they're giving you information on where you can't broadcast um, and, and how to protect the, the incumbent. They don't know what you actually did. And I don't want that to be a platitude for, oh, they don't know what I'm doing. Let's go do whatever we want to do because sure. that will destroy the band yeah. very, very quickly. Um, but the object here is that the AFC is not a police policing radio. It is a, or device or algorithm. Uh, it is a informational device. Right. So if it if it deems you are able to operate in this area, or let's say it says you cannot, it's not saying you cannot on this particular frequency slice. You can use these other frequencies. It's it's binary. It's either there's somebody kind of there, and it doesn't matter what frequency you might still have available or not, you cannot operate, basically. So it's not going to protect you from other, just like CBRS, it's not going to protect you from other operators who are operating unlicensed Part 15, 6 gigahertz standard power outdoor. But it will um, protect the, the licensed I'm incumbents. Talking about. Yeah. Right. Right. So if there is, it doesn't matter what frequency the incumbent is on, and even though there might be spectrum available, you know, outside of where the incumbent is operating, you can't operate there at all if it it says that path or whatever is is used. Is, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's it is not it it is opportunistic in a way, but if there's a protected frequency, you're given that information. Okay, well, just curious. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. When the the AFC approval notice from the ACC came out, you know, in February, it did have that conflict resolution nugget in there that was like yeah. uh, April 27th or whatever the date was. And it was like, yeah, if you guys haven't figured this out by then, um, then we're going to take back your good boy points and then shut it down until you figure out what's going on. So it's definitely a, uh, I don't know. It was definitely a less gentle push, <laughs> but I think the, realistically, the AFC providers are, financially driven to get this done right so you know i was nervous about it when well, i first business, read that as you say their business depends upon protecting those incumbents and protecting them well because what's the point in having afcs if you don't do that um and one of the other hats i wear and because i have all this you need lots of hats the um <laughs> other hat that i wear is that i'm the, one of the co-chairs of the multi-stakeholder group for six gigahertz which was uh-huh. created by the fcc and has both incumbents and non-incumbents and it's a very big group they didn't give us a whole lot of authority um and they they made it rather difficult to come to consensus but we dealt with that issue of how do we deal with uh interferers who learn who claim 
how do we deal with incumbents that claim that there's an interferer? How do you do the triangulation, figure out who it is? And even if you find out who it is, how do you deal with it? Uh, and that's always been an issue in shared spectrum. It's always been in, in an issue in shared spectrum where there's no incumbents. And even at five gigahertz, you know, that's the the preeminent band used by unlicensed band used by WISPs today. We conflict, right? So how do we do it? We we call up the guy next door and say, "You use channel A, I'll use channel B." Or, "You son of a bitch, don't do that." <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. There there is human contact. There's usually a method for for getting off the channel, and uh, I I suspect a routine will fall into place for six gigahertz as well. Yeah, they'll have to. And there's some pretty, um, not a opponents but i guess the the stakeholders like your your at&t's and stuff right you know mm -hmm. i think they've been one of the more vocal ones saying hey guys this is okay but we need to be very careful and it's actually i was kind of not surprised but it was it was good to see their uh notices and stuff you know you read through it at first you're like they don't want us to succeed but when you read through what they're saying you're like no this is actually kind of reasonable right um i mean because you know, it's not just them from a business perspective. There are so many of these links that run six gig, these long links. I've put a lot of them up for state agencies, 911 yep. systems, the government and stuff like that. So, you know, I think everyone seems to be pretty, pretty much on board as to, you know, what this should be. Uh, seems like the mechanisms are going to operate smoother. So, you know, maybe, maybe not quite the bumpy start that SAS had in the beginning uh, with CBRS. Yeah, I wouldn't. It wouldn't bother me if there's some bumps. Uh, the bumps themselves give us the information we need to better protect. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. I work with AT&T on a daily basis. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, them and Southern Company and, and utilities and all kinds of users who use the point-to-point -point and these silly, crazy people called WISPs who also have these licenses. <laughs> the, the, the fact of the matter is that everyone wants to protect that use. That use is, we don't have so much backhaul, right? Protected yep. backhaul. In fact, WISP was trying to get more protected backhaul. And so if you look at 6 and 5 and 11, those are basically your prime channels for backhaul. If one of them goes away, that's a big deal. So our objective here is both protect those uh, those point-to-point -point links and make it good for the rest of the man's use. That's what shared spectrum is all about. 100%. So the AF AFC mechanism, like one of the, the things that you see people get a little bit nervous about is the, the SAS system was a little bumpy, you know, when it first began. Mm -hmm. uh, way, way better now than it used to be for sure, right? But, you know, like any big convoluted system, you got to work the kinks out. You know, people are worried about we're going to see sort of similar bumps with AFC, but the AFC as a whole, the mechanisms and stuff, how often it checks in, what it looks for and stuff seems to be much more, not simplified is probably not the right word, but there's a lot less to it because basically it's giving you, hey, these channels are open. You know, you can use these channels and these channel widths because you're not dealing with a mobile aspect or like, I don't know, a battle cruiser coming in on a six gig and wiping out the whole band, right? Most of these right. are ULS links that are fixed. So, but maybe you can speak to that a little bit, you know, from a stability perspective or maybe why this mechanism is a lot sort of simpler than what we've seen before and maybe folks shouldn't really be too concerned about it. Yeah, back in the day, the FCC considered that 5 gigahertz, 5, 8 gigahertz, and, and uh, 2, 4, and 900 were garbage spectrum because no one would ever be able to get along on those bands, and those were bands that no one really cared anything about, and, and there would be no way to protect them. And look, here we are, what, 20-something years later, and Wi-Fi certainly occupies more uh, use than any other frequencies probably combined and my guess yeah. is if you took all the licensed bands you still don't have the billions of devices that you have in wi-fi so is it more wi-fi ish or is it more license ish um i think it's more wi-fi ish it's wi-fi ish on steroids because you have better equipment you have equipment that can do more um it has some internal protections in it the equipment itself it's it's better with noise it's uh out of band um, emissions issues are not as much as as early Wi-Fi was, or and are not as strict as uh, the OOBE is in 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 um, CBRS. So you, you've got a band that has one more step that has to take place over what you do in Wi-Fi. 
It's not licensed. Okay, so this is part 15. So you're not going out and buying a license. You're not registering with the FCC for a license. That doesn't mean you can do anything the heck you want to do, but it means that uh, the opportunity is there for a lot of devices to operate in the same space. We know that frequency reuse is something that's very viable and can happen. We know that um, these are lower power devices. These are not 50 watts. These are more in line with what <laughs> uh, standard 5 gigahertz radio is using. And so, you know, will it work and will there be bumps in the road in the beginning? I think, excuse me, as long as the standard power radios uh, listen to the direction of the AFC and not intentionally put devices which point their directional antennas directly at the beam, or the Fresnel zone of the of the point to point, then um, it's going to work. We're going to have some bumps. There is no question about it. And there's going to be a whole lot of equipment in this band. That's my prediction. And yeah. with a whole lot of equipment, there will be some bumps and bounces. But the other thing is, is that people will get used to those bumps and bounces in the same way that they do on 5.8 and the, the same way that they do on 900 or 2.4 or any other band where, where anyone can come in anytime that they want. And you're not protected from the other guys. So you're forced to get along because the other guys are going to have the same problem as you are. Um, you know, that's the nice thing about physics. It's pretty fair. Yeah, yeah. And I think... With the output power that's there for the incumbent links, I think an, uh, a WISP operator would be pretty silly if he looked at a spectrum scan, you know, and and was actually in in the path of one of these licensed links and said, "Hey, this looks clean. Let, let me operate here." I mean, it would just it would shut him down instantly because it overpowered everything. Yeah, I mean, everything. and and as you know, if it's if it was harming another WISP. That gets around the community pretty quickly. If you're yeah. harming someone like AT and T, they're going to come to you pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So, and 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 I think they should. I, I yeah. don't have any issue Agreed. with this. This is not Agreed. a fairness issue. This is not yep. a oh, wisp should be in head ahead on this. Yep. Yep. This is an issue where if we stay in our right places, we get a benefit that no hasn't been there. It's quite a bit of spectrum, and it's it's wonderful for use. And we don't know what's happening totally with 5.9 gigahertz at the moment you know we're in line to continue the use that's being used we've been using these special temporary authorities in 5.9 uh during covid and doing an excellent job of providing broadband services to people who needed it so think about that you got 5.8 5.9 and 6 all in a row think about how much spectrum that is that's a lot of spectrum yep. and you know with new technologies on uh, beam forming and null forming and the ability to to squash out much noise to detect when there's cross uh when there's cross interference causing a, de a degradation in in the power um a directional antennas better focused radios better focused masks you take all of that together you can live in the same environment it is it is totally possible we've been Reliably. doing it for years you've been doing it for years decades actually so yeah and even with those fancy antennas I've heard about, <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's some pretty cool ones out there. I've heard. Yeah. There. yeah. The um, it is kind of funny too. People are like, I want to be the first to deploy on this tower. I'm going to use up all the six gig spectrum and won't let anyone else use it. You know, like a land grab scenario. And I'm like, that's yeah. one approach, but like there is no ownership just because you're the first one there. You see, you no. see that kind of bumble <laughs> up a lot. And you're you're still going to have to apply the same principles in your network design in six as you are in five or literally any other band, right? So, right. But one of the advantages of six gigahertz is you can use larger channels. Uh -huh. I mean, what, when we get to the next generation of these things, you may be able to use 360 meg channels, which mm -hmm. God knows why you want to use a 320 <laughs> or 360 megahertz channel. Thank you. But, but it, it has the possibilities. I mean, yeah. most of us are using like 40 40 to 80 and 80 is rare you know where most of us use use 20 megahertz to 40 uh double so a and b so you've got a, you you're very conservative on what you're using and i don't anticipate that people are going to jump up to these massive power uh massive amounts of spectrum just because it happens to be sitting there that that's management issue uh you will run into interference that you're going to have to deal with it's not pretty and and it costs you to do that yeah. so use the using the right or appropriate amount of bandwidth and the right or appropriate amount of power um is what will sustain the industry well that's exactly right and i think uh people are are learning that and they will learn it quick right because the snr requirements of radios mm -hmm. at those extremely wide channels make the 
operating distances extremely short. And like you said, I, th- I think the pre-SIM report still showed that 20 megahertz is the most popular channel size that people are using these days, up to 40. I, I predict that in 6 gigahertz, 80 megahertz will be pretty much the, the, the average. Uh, even though radio has been able to do it now, they haven't been very successful so, yeah, uh, I mean, people will start with the Y channel, but I think they'll end up falling between 40 and 80 megahertz on, yeah, it's on average. it's much cleaner, and yep. it works. Yep. Um, you know, the cable industry went out and put modems um, and switches all over the place, and they opened up these 80 megahertz channels yeah. just for the public to use. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> creating noise for the purpose of creating noise is uh, just not a good thing. And, no. you know, that conversation has been had. Um in this band, I don't see that happening, but, you know, the potential for using wire for, for specialty purposes, depending upon if you're trying to, for example, in a stadium yeah. you know, or in a mine, if you want a wider channel and there's a reason for it, you have the option to do it. And if you're in an area, a rural area or underground or whatever, you're not likely to be causing interference to anyone else. So go ahead and do it, but don't do it just to do the land grab thing. That's yeah. probably not a great idea. My biggest, my biggest worry there again is, you know, <clears throat> I I see Wisps trying to offer gigabits or beyond gigabits, and they 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 want to offer these three hundred meg channels or one hundred and twenty meg channels, whatever it is, to get this maximum bandwidth, and they start selling the service and offering this service, and yeah, it starts working great at first, but then other people come around, and then what happens when you're forced? to go down to a more narrow channel. And now you can't offer the speeds you were initially offering because you don't have the spectrum available, right? That's that's what I worry about, overselling things based on that. This is kind of a, a segue into CBRS, right? And what I see now, I do see a lot of throughput being pushed uh, on CBRS equipment that's out there. And it's, it's, it's incredible what's being done. But I'm worried about when more and more CBRS operators uh, start uh, firing up their stations when GAA starts dropping down, and and all of a sudden you're using you're, you're being allotted less of that. You know, operators may not be able to offer the speeds they started offering because the spectrum starts uh, adjusting on them, and it's just a word of caution. After so many years of doing this, you know that people should be maybe a little bit more conservative with their offering. And, and not assume that the spectrum they're using today is going to be there in this shared system in the future. Yeah, I mean, there's a limited amount of spectrum. That's why we're using shared spectrum. Yeah. If we had yeah. all the spectrum we possibly wanted, we didn't need to share it with anyone. We'd just say, you can have that much, you can have that much, no problem. But the problem is we've run out of you can use that much. And spectrum isn't all built equally. Um, you know, low band, fre- low frequency band uh, spectrum is good for getting around some pine needles and trees and obstacles, but it doesn't carry a lot of data. Yep. High band millimeter wave frequencies are fantastic for carrying lots of data, but they go very, very short distances. You know, in most cases, they'll go less than a kilometer and and, and their purpose is mostly for bridging, And, and they but they can carry an, an immense amount of data. If you're going rooftop to rooftop, perfect solution because you can carry gigs of, of data. Yep. But the natural place for most of our operators is in the mid band. And the mid band is very limited in the available frequencies because three, you know, three gigahertz is the prime real estate. CBRS takes up a portion of that. C band now takes up the upper portion of that. Uh, three point, you know, the three point four five to three point five five takes down the lower portion of that. Um, we have one more band sitting out there in the national spectrum strategy called the 3.1 to 3.45 band, which everyone wants to claim and everyone wants, <laughs> except the United States military, who says, oh, it will cost $108 billion to move these things out of that band. So if you've got 3.1 to 3.45, 3.45 to 3.55, 3.55 to 3.7, 3.7 to 3.98, how much is left of, of 3 gigahertz? Now you say move into 4. Well, in four, there are a few gaps, but mostly they're used by government entities, satellite uh, devices, and otherwise. There is not as much four as you think. Five, we all use, so we know what the unis are in five, and there's some protected areas in five as well. We just talked about pretty much all of six up to seven, right? We're getting up with the upper portion of that middle band that's got not a whole, got a lot of room. 
there, between seven and nine, there are some open bands or some potentially reassigned bands that could be used for sharing. And above that, you're getting into fairly high frequency. So you see the problem. There's not a whole lot of frequency left. And you can head south, you know, 2.5, licensed band, very popular with, with the a carrier. And, and you start looking at that band and you go, oh, that band's already taken. And right beneath that are most of the cellular bands and scientific bands and the old TV white space bands. And we're now down to 400 kilohertz. And we've already talked all the way up to 10 gigahertz, which is already being used for point to point and satellite. That's 10 gigahertz of bandwidth that's already occupied, including all of the mid band. <laughs> yeah. That's why this matters. It's really, really important. And while people should be able to do new things, well, that's exactly what we want. That's why we go into the, the, the specifications for these bands and we try and make them technology neutral because we want, we want radio manufacturers to come out with new things and new approaches that will not interfere but provide greater efficiencies. That's why we want antenna manufacturers to take a look at the process and say, how can I stay super focused and provide the best amount of, of gain and output that I can on my antennas? We want the, the filters uh, people and the receiver people to say, keep your masks as tight as possible so you're not overlapping into other bands. If we make the equipment on all portions of it as good as it can be, then we can share it and we double, triple, even many, many times uh, the amount of usability that it has had in the past. And that is why we're why at WISPA we strive for sharing spectrum. 100%. Definitely. I don't know. My radio knob uh, channel width thing goes has a knob that goes to 11. So, by God, mm -hmm. if there's 11 on there, I'm going to use it. Wide channels. Yep, but um, 11 has <laughs> already got point-to-point -point licensed and unlicensed as well. And 10 to 10.5 is a band that WISPA is seeking for yeah. backhaul. So, you're losing between 10 and 11 pretty soon quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and there's uses in 12, those little flying satellites up there. They uh, like 12 and, you know, 13. <laughs> yeah. I don't know much out about there. fourteen and fifteen, but you can keep going on. It 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 it, it is really heavily used. Yep, yep. Um, all right, one last question about six, and then I want to talk a little bit about more CBRS stuff. So, in the AFC, so we know geolocation is a thing, and your output power is cap thirty six dBm ERP and the standard power stuff that we're doing. Is there a directionality um, in sort of coverage area or like antenna specs that fall into the AFC in these calculations as to what channels are open? Or is it a purely point source isotropic 36 dB iron bubble they draw around it and figure out where it could uh, be interfering? Because we don't record at this point, and this could change because it changed the CBRS, at, because we don't record the uh, the directionality and the down tilt and the uh, gain of the antenna, we we have to assume an isotropic approach, and so the AFC is looking from uh, you know if my user who I have to protect is anywhere in the scope or range of that uh, device, and that device is using either a sweep type antenna or or an omnidirectional type antenna then they have the potential to interfere. So it, it does assume a more conservative stance at the moment. Uh -huh. WISPA has sought in an NPRM or in a further notice uh, to provide additional information and more uh -huh. characteristics on approaching it from allowing the AFCs to at least consider enhanced antenna patterns um, and also to consider directionality. Directionality should always be one of the considerations any shared mechanism uses. Um, we haven't convinced them of that completely yet. It's still on the radar to do that. Um, but for now, uh, most of the calculations, they take into effect some aspect of that, but it's it's not a specific aspect. Okay. So now channel availability in the grand scheme of things is probably the most conservative, not worst case, but it's the most conservative. Eventually, we if we add in some directionality and antenna sizing and things like that, then we could start potentially seeing a lot more channels open up that were previously blocked. Now, that said, you know, everything I've seen, I've been actually quite surprised in most locations, the number and sizes of the channels that are available. Because, 
Yeah, at first, I'm like, we're never going to be able to get a channel anywhere rural where you've got these six gig links in a lot of cases. But I mean, from everything I've seen, it looks way better than I had originally thought. Well, think about it this way. Now, six gigahertz is not a millimeter wave, uh, so it, it can go great distances. So as a backhaul, um, it, it's an ideal backhaul. Mm -hmm. It is a fairly good size beam width. Um, so that means that it is susceptible to some interference, but it's also six gigahertz, not 900 megahertz. Mm -hmm. And so you can look at the Fresnel zone and you can look at the power that's being used and the distances between those links and you can do some avoidance techniques. You know, if you know you're going like this and another one's going like this, you point the laser over there, you know, and, and it is perfectly capable, you are perfectly capable of doing those kind of measurements to say, this is how I avoid having a problem. Um, the way I, I like to do it, especially up in the millimeter range, millimeter wave range is say, take out your red or green laser, actually take out your red laser in a gymnasium because we do not want to point these at airplanes, point, the, point it at the wall, okay? And you get this nice little dot um, sitting on the wall. And now we smoke up the room and we see that nice narrow beam that goes in there. Now, close your eyes, put on a blindfold, spin you around six times, and the other person has a green one. Turn it on. What's the likelihood you're going to cross beams with that red beam that's sitting there? Pretty slim, Good. right? Because there's a lot of room in that room, and there's a lot of space in that space, and the statistical likelihood that your narrow directional beam is going to cross that narrow directional beam is pretty low. And in 6 gigahertz, it's a little more because the beams are wider. The Fresnel zone is wider, but it's not infinite. And you can calculate ways to use the space that's not being used. Yeah, and like I said, there are a lot of channels, and it looks like hopefully there'll be a lot more sort of open up as they refine these calculation methods and stuff over time. And, you know, it'll be an iterative process for sure. Yeah. So You don't open the gate on a new frequency and expect it to work perfectly out the, out the door. Nah, nah, for sure. So, well, hopefully we'll start seeing a lot of gear going up soon. We'll have stuff pretty soon. We're, we're real excited. So, uh, real kind of quick, um, thinking about CBRS. So, there's a couple of things, you know, CBRS is still plugging and chugging. Actually, I think it's got a lot more traction than it has over the last couple of years. Uh, and I think there's two sort of things driving that, at least, you know, from my perspective is one, you know, in, in our space, a lot of people started deploying CBRS because it was better at uh, foliage penetration. I mean, clear spectrum, obviously, right? Yep. But from a physics perspective, everyone's like, hey, I'll be able to shoot through more foliage. It's a lower frequency and get through more stuff. And that was the more main power too. Yeah, and more power, exactly. And those were the driving things. But now, ever since beads come out, and there's been this whole conversation about, you know, what is reliable, unlicensed versus licensed and stuff, we see a lot of people who are using CBRS now and deploying because it is licensed by rule, um, I believe is the proper thing that I always mess up, right? That that's GAA. You're right, the uh, GAA. GAA is licensed by rule and PAL is priority, priority access license. Right. So, you know, to those out there that are that are doing that, I mean, you know, a lot of us say, hey, we have reliable, you know, 100 meg or above service and this license by rule service to sort of block out bead overbuilding is where a lot of this is going and stuff. I mean, you know, what are what do you think, what are your thoughts on that or you know, where do you see this going? What are some pitfalls that you may run into with this sort of thing? Um, cause it's gotten to be a really popular topic lately and then you're as well qualified to speak about this as anyone is for sure. So bead and RDOF and CAF one and CAF two and the, uh, ag funds, our U S ag funds and the treasury funds <laughs> and so on and so on and so <laughs> forth all have strings attached in case you didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and they are big strings. They're yarn. They're this big. <laughs> and you you need to be aware of what uh, those strings are attached to. Uh, and you need to be aware of those even if you're not going to use those funds or even if you're not going to apply for those funds. Um, and in many cases, the, uh, the window for applying for those funds may not be even open anymore. Understand that bead is a, I, I think there was good intent behind it. And I think that the the Congress and the White House, when they passed the infrastructure uh, bill, they they wanted to see ubiquitous 
broadband across the United States, and that's a fair and reasonable thing to want. They want to do away with the digital divide. They want to provide for digital equity, and they want to provide reasonable and fair service to every household and business in America. There's a reason why we don't have it in every household in America today. Um, I, I get told about the parallels with the electrification of the, of the United States using things like the example of TVA. Believe it or not, we have not electrified all of the United States, even 50 or 80 years later. Uh, there are portions of the United States that literally do not have good sources or even access to commercial electrical services. I'm not expecting us to take 80 years, but in fact, in order to achieve the purpose that the government wants, it has to pay attention to more than simply a few um, specific factors. Fiber is very nice. It's glassy. You can see it. You get all kinds of pretty colors. It can be buried underground. It can be put up on poles. It also can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to go past one single home. Um, now, that isn't the norm. You know, when you do a, a, a unified project across uh, urban areas in particular, fiber may be a, a fantastic role. But the fact of the matter is, in these areas that aren't covered or don't have good service or are unserved or underserved, underserved means they have no competition, there's a reason that they're underserved. It's very expensive to serve them. And in CAF 1 and in CAF 2 and in RDOF, we spent millions of dollars at the FCC level saying, fill in those gaps. It's time. Fill in those gaps. Mm -hmm. Here's this money. And they took that money and went to New York. And they went to San Francisco and they went to Chicago, but they did not go to Little Town, USA. Yep. Why? It's too darn expensive to go into Little Town, USA. So if the mandate today is take funds, give the rural areas and the underserved areas the service that they so desire and so need and so should get, how do you get it there? Well, you can throw money at it. That's number one. You take B, there's 42.5, 42.8, I forget the exact number, billion with a B dollars put into that. Okay, that's more dollars than our industry has ever seen. And you do that across um, all 50 states and tribal territories and our territories. And you say, go states, go tell us how you're going to do this. Because of course, the federal government hasn't a clue. So they're going to give it to the states to say, hey, you know your area, go do it. And the states go, we don't even have a broadband office. We don't have anything except this old economic development. Oh, we better hire people quickly. So the federal government said, let's throw $100 million at every state to do planning. That'll take care of the problem. They'll build broadband offices who will solve all of these problems. So we got these wonderful new, very green, broadband offices in every state who said, hmm, maybe $42.5 billion isn't going to be enough money for this. And they looked at, and the federal government looked at it and I said, that's more money we ever given you. There's 25% contributions. It's $50 billion. How can you not cover all of the states? Well, it, it, if you go out there and tell me I have to use fiber, I, it, it can cost me $20,000 to go buy Bill's farm. And then John's farm, the next farm over, might be 40000 and so on and so forth. And if I spend all the bead money on there, then I don't have money to do digital equity, and I can't cover the other areas that I have. How am I supposed to do this? Oh, and by the way, we just got done with this silly little health issue called COVID, and there's no labor around. And the supply chain comes mostly from China, and you put in the, the, in the bead you got to buy American and you got to use American labor standards and you have to do it by this schedule. And I can't do it because I don't have those products. Those products are made in China. And by the way, they cost more because there's now a huge competitive market for them. Hmm. Those areas that you want to cover, maybe we'll cover them last. Oh, doesn't that sound like Ardoff and CAF and so forth? So the, the object here is, is there RF solutions which we all know are reliable, which we all know can be comparable to license, which we all know can be comparable to fiber and complement each other because the WISP community and the FWA community have nothing against the fiber community. We love the fiber community. Most of us use them for backhaul, even fiber to the home, but we yep. do not have the ability to do that in every location. So CBRS, right? I, you knew I'd get back to it at some point. <laughs> CBRS what is a band that is in the middle. 
it's licensed by rule. It has that little licensed word on it. And in, in the NTIA, they placed a very big emphasis on the ability to use licensed frequency if you're not using fiber because licensed is, quote unquote, in air quotes, reliable. Great. At first, we thought that was the giveaway, that, that CBRS is, of course, licensed. It's licensed by rule. The FCC said it's licensed. PALs are clearly licensed. And then the BDC came around. And we changed the way we report to the FCC on what's covered and not covered. And at first, no problem. 70 and 71 are two categories which said, you know, you're either unlicensed or you're licensed. We jumble a little which category should it be in. But, of course, they should be in 71. It wasn't that entirely clear. So we called up the FCC and said, hey, FCC, where should this license, where should CBRS go? And they said, well, CBRS is like unlicensed. So we're going to put it into the unlicensed sphere. What? You're going to put it in unlicensed? It's not unlicensed. It's licensed by rule. And we had this big to-do. FCC, to its credit, backed down on that issue and said, yeah, you're right. Report it as 71. Report it like it's, it's a licensed frequency. And that was great for two rounds of BDC until the BDC group itself at the FCC said, hmm, we want to get more granular. Let's get more granular. Let's add category 72, which is for GAA. Okay, so if you use GAA, you just report it under 72, and we're good. What does 72 mean? Is 72 licensed? Is 72 meet the NTIA requirements? Because the NTIA and the FCC are not talking to one another on this subject. So we had a big period of time where we're going, you just changed BDC, and you threw all these things which we thought was settled into another category. What do we do now? And again, to their credit, um, the FCC said, go talk to the NTIA. And so we went to go talk to the NTIA, and the NTIA finally, through Alan Davidson, the chair um, of, of, the, uh, of this process, uh, said, yes, GAA is licensed by rule. It is reliable. It is within the factoring uh, for BEAT. How many other license frequencies do WISPs have that qualify for that? You might have a little 2.5. You might have a little bit of 11 backhaul. But for the most part, even if you got some secondary market stuff here and there, maybe a PAL or two, you're not going to go out and buy licensed frequency, especially if not for your whole network. So this is the only one that you've got that actually is licensed by the politics of the day and works for doing deployments which in fact will protect you from being overbuilt because if you if you deploy CVRS and you meet the 100 by 20 category 100 up or down uh, and 20 up you have the ability to provide a network with RF that meets their requirements we all know that 58 and all of the others especially in rural environments is providing a 100 percent reliable product there's no interference it's a directed signal it's in that little mid and down area we talked about before it's pretty and it works mm -hmm. they're not engineers at ntia not for the most part and they they take political direction and when pol politics collides with policy in spectrum you get a nuclear explosion and that's what we had so we quashed the nuclear explosion, at least with regard to CBRS. And thankfully, you can now deploy CBRS in order to avoid um, the bead overbuild requirements and participate in bead if you want to. You can go after the funds. That is one method. There are other methods, but that is a really good one for CBRS. And they've codified this or written it down somewhere. So they're, they're probably not apt to change their mind on this six months down the road there was an opinion by uh mr davidson's office that was written and provided so uh it has been clarified as far as we know fantastic absolutely fantastic so yeah we've seen a lot of that sort of stuff happening i think we're going to see a ton more um i think it is important to know people are like well six gig has a system it's called it's got letters on this afc thing so that applies as well and i think it's important that people understand that no that is not the case in six gig with the AFC. It is not covered by this license by rule. Um, it it's popped up more than you would think or hope for sure. So it hits me at least once a week and at a very high levels. <laughs> you, you have to go through an AFC, therefore it must be licensed, right? No, it's part fifteen. 
uh, it, it, it's, it, it works like license, therefore it must be licensed, right? No, it's part 15. Can we change it? No, you, you can't change it. It's part 15. And so there's the advantages of having an unlicensed spectrum that lets you do things very flexibly the way you want, and there's the disadvantages that it is not a licensed frequency that can be used with beat. That is not saying it cannot be used with beat. 5.8, 6, maybe 5.9, 2.4, 4 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz, and all the rest of them can be used if there's an ultra-high cost area for which the states plead and say it's too expensive for us to put fiber in everywhere or licensed in everywhere. There, You can go ahead and make the state make a plead to say allow RF in our, our mix. Great. 100% do it. Um, I think, you know, there's been a lot of hesitation. There's been a, a lot of hesitation in the market, not knowing what bead was going to look like, not knowing what the AFC was going to do and what the real world results are, when it was going to happen. And honestly, I think a lot of the, you know, AFC is happening. Six gigs is a real thing. Uh, SAS with CBRS has gotten way cooler than it used to be. Uh, now, especially they're doing these uh, strength or widening out the heartbeats and stuff. So that makes the whole SAS process a lot less onerous. So like really in terms of tools in the toolbox, there's so many options available now. And the bead monster that everyone was terrified of for a long time is not nearly as scary now that there's been a lot more light just shined upon it. So I think, right. you know, if you're in that hesitation or, you know, um, bummed out or not sure what to do. Honestly, you know, I think there's never been as many tools in the toolbox between the policies, the physics, the the spectrum availability, and the tech. There's a lot of really cool tech that's coming out that, you know, manufacturers of radio platforms, antennas, so on and so forth, have been able to adapt and change and, you know, change some the ways, the, the core ways we're used to doing stuff. So there's been no better time to say, hey, let's build these networks. Let's continue to grow and, you know, get it down the road. Yeah, I mean, and, and at the end of the day, you know, just because you have coverage with the technology that's licensed by rule or whatever, whatever it means, doesn't mean that somebody's not going to come in and try and overbuild you anyway. They may not be able to use the bead funds to do that, but there's people with their own money and private equity and, you know, big guys with uh, lots of money in the bank that if they want to come in the area, they're going to come in the area. They just can't use the free government money, you know, to, to do it, you know, so. I mean, let's be real about something. Wisps have never had to compete against anyone ever, right? Yeah, yeah right, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, there's sure, no never. competition nah, out there. Nah, nah. 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 Yeah, I, yeah, and some of that non-competition has included AT and T, Verizon, Timo, you know, yep. uh, Comcast, Charter, Cox, Spectrum. We've been doing uh, it for years. Yeah. Systems and a hundred other co-ops and a hundred other things, right? So, so the truth is that yes, this is an obstacle, but you know, you're fighters. You always have been fighters, and it's a big country. And 1990, nine, 2000. 2010, 2015, 2016, it's still not covered. Yeah. <laughs> there's still lots of places that are not covered, and there's still lots of places that, that WISPs have been covering for many years where nobody else comes in. Yeah. Do we fear that Comcast, Charter, Cox, AT&T, Verizon, Timo, whoever it is, even DISH, come in? Are, you want, may come in? Sure, we'll compete. Maybe we'll collaborate. That's what I would love, really love to see. I'd love to see a collaboration between fixed wireless providers and maybe a cable industry who puts down strands and then doesn't do anything beyond a few meters beyond that. Yep. You have all this capacity to cover America in much better forms to provide lots of competition. And we are experts at fixed wireless. Why not combine those two? That's my dream. That's Richard's dream. It's been Richard's dream for 10 years. Um, I think it's a, it's a viable one. And when I approach the large providers about these things, they always go, oh, that's a good idea. We need to find <laughs> some way to actually do that. The same yeah. way we are sharing spectrum with them now to say, look, you're not covering these clients or maybe your competition is covering those clients. Why not have an inroad into those clients? Yep. And yep. at the same time, we want 
we want the bands that we argue for. You know, we've talked a lot about six gigahertz and CBRS, but there are lots of other bands. And in those other bands, we want to make sure that there's a competitive play for fixed wireless and that, that it encourages a robust and efficient uh, ecosystem with lots of tools that come from the manufacturers, including better and better um, equipment that can give you more and more available space. Amen. Amen. We always we always talk about the private public partnerships with WISPs going to talk to their local governments and stuff like that as far as this funding. Really you, you shed some light on that that private private partnership where WISPs should look at working with uh, some of these larger operators. And like you said, I mean, uh, a lot can be done there. We just have to look at different ways and, and diversify our, our business models, not just, you know, what equipment we use and what frequencies we use. So an interesting point of view. I like that. Uh, one last thought on that. So now that we have six gigahertz and we have CBRS, we have the ability to do more than just to lo- deliver signal to the point of demarcation. The point of demarcation at a home or at a business is a great place. It's where you drop the the line from the from the CPE and you say, "I've done my job. You now have broadband. Go go off and multiply." There's a whole world inside that building. Go do some indoor wireless wireless work. Understand that Wi-Fi is not the only solution. CBRS is now becoming one of the best options for indoor. WLAN has existed for years. Go do managed Wi-Fi if you want to indoor. Do something inside and beyond the point of demarcation. There are viruses and predators and so forth. Come in and help them with that. Help yeah. them with with uh, managing the the signal in their in their house or office. If they're if they're an industrial or a a commercial group, don't just drop it at the edge of the line. Work with John Deere and understand that their equipment now has Wi-Fi on board. It geofences. It does moisture sensing in the ground. It monitors dairy flow. It monitors the geofencing part, stops that equipment from leaving or being stolen or changed. It monitors their engine and the oil levels. There are a thousand vertical markets that WISPs could be involved with, with the types of tools they have today. Think beyond the box. Yeah, exactly. I had... uh, uh Somebody in the industry a long time ago, a friend of mine I haven't talked to in a while, but he had mentioned that once, and it wasn't on the technical side. He's like, but when I, you know, I do my WISP business, he goes, when I walk into one of my customers' offices, he goes, I look around, I'm like, man, I want to sell them the toilet paper in their thing. I want to sell them the (laughs) papers for their printers, their toner. He's like, there's so much business that you have access to once you have a foot in the door for a business that you can do, you know, so... Especially Crazy. in MDUs and MTEs. You know, you've got these multiple dwelling units, multiple family units, like yep. condos, even even multiple tenant enterprises that are businesses. They're all right there and there's all this opportunity. And yeah. maybe selling them toilet paper and printer paper is not the idea <laughs> because that's probably going a little beyond the scope of what makes your business flow correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But selling of the allied services, absolutely. Yeah. We'll yeah. monitor your building. There's security and surveillance that we can do. Yep. There's, you know, your toilets are flooding when you're not there. We can monitor that. There's 100,000 yeah. things that will relate to the delivery of broadband signal and, and that, that make the possibilities endless. And with more spectrum and with more tools and the ability to use fiber and the ability to get even into the mobile world if you want to, provides you with this all-source approach that can make your business more than one-dimensional. For sure, for sure. Well, guys, we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, you know, we could, uh, all of us are apt to, to get on soapbox and, and start going for a bit. We could probably keep on this for hours, but uh, Richard's probably got some work to do, get back banging those drums uh, and getting things done here. So is there anything in closing, you know, closing statement or, you know, other than what you've done? Although I think, you know, I, th- I think we've summed things up really well. Couple, couple, couple of brief points. One, the tools are out there. Use them. Don't be afraid of them. Learn them. Yes, you have to use a CPI and CBRS. All that means is that either you get someone certified or you hire somebody who is certified so that they can sign off on the information that's necessary to protect the band. It's not that hard. It's not that expensive. SAS is for what you need to know. It's not that complicated. And if you have a really bad experience with a SAS, go to another one. You're allowed to change uh, SASs. You're allowed to change equipment. Um, and 
there's some very exciting things. I can't talk a lot about it, but there's some very exciting things coming in CBRS in the next couple of months that will reduce uh, the impacts of some of the negative things in CBRS very, very significantly. Remember I said do things indoors. Watch for this. CBRS, um, even in DPA zones, indoors, likely going to be a big deal. And 6 gigahertz, I can't say more about how the opportunity you have there. It's like opening or doubling or tripling the, the spectrum you have. It's using, you know, the new Wi-Fi 7 and Wi-Fi 6E. It, you have the ability to use these tools, which you never had before. You've got really specialized antennas. You have reasonably priced equipment when you compare it to the carrier's equipment. Yep. Go for it. Use it the way you can. Use it at, and help us at WISPA get more for what you need. If you need backhaul, support us in 10 to 10.5. If you need information on how to use IoT or how to connect yourself in an area, we have resources for that. Avail yourself. Um, a lot of people like to sit around and complain. I do it myself. <laughs> And there's a lot to complain about, but there's yeah. also a lot to be very, very thankful for and a lot to be uh, used, a lot of opportunity. So I beckon upon you, as they did in the old day, go forth and multiply, do something wonderful, <laughs> use some of this stuff. And Man, I'm just fired up. It. I'm ready to go out and smash I, something. I know, I'm excited. Something. I want to go do something now, too. <laughs> um, and then anyone looking to get in touch with you, Richard, what's the best way for them to find you? Yeah, um, of course... WISPA.org has all of the contact, uh, contacts for WISPA. Uh, we have a robust staff that deals with everything from the shows. Join us at WISP America. Join us at WISP Lusa. Join us on our lobbying days in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Join us with our state effort to try and deal with things at each the, uh, of the state levels. We have state coordinators for all 50 states. Join us on our technical side. So you can join a group that, that, that is involved with the tech, technical matters that you need to learn or you want to share your information. That's the greatest thing about this industry. Why I stay in this industry? We share. We, we, are, we have a collegiality. We compete, but we share. And that is uh, really, really wonderful. Website, number one. Come to the webinars, number two. Come to the events, number three. I'm available. You can reach out to me. People do it every single day. Uh, my phone number, I'll, I'll give you my phone number. It's its not a secret. It's 408-472-0881. You can reach me at rbernhardt at B-E-R-N-H-A-R-D-T-C, right there on the bottom, rbernhardt at wispa.org, and I'm happy to talk to you. All right, toss us, you know, I'm looking for us. Where can they find us? Yeah, you can find us all over on social media, on Facebook, and a lot of the WISP groups, of course. There's always our website, rfelements.com. You can email us, tassos at rfelements.com or caleb at rfelements.com. And until next time, everyone, go out there, multiply, smash something, do whatever you got to do. Just do it. Just do something. Get excited. <laughs> Get motivated. Let's go. Bye, Use everybody. the tools. Yeah. All right. Bye. <laughs> Bye. See you. Bye.